good afternoon. Uh, Claire, good afternoon world. Good afternoon, Thomas. Uh, we have uh, for, for the next class seminar, we have somebody who has been visiting Claire actually uh, not long ago, Thomas Johansen. Uh, Thomas is an artist. Uh, well, let's see if he will make us sing today. Uh, there, there will be there will be something about singing as a swarm, and we we have met at uh, at the um, symposium, uh, a class symposium uh, on self organization, and you have been uh, you have been showing us how singing together is a self organizing activity and how sounds that we emit can be uh, those units uh, of self organization, which was which was very very interesting so i i'm curious what we will show us today so if that's okay i'm putting the spotlight on you and uh yeah uh, and welcome thank you for for coming well thank you marta uh welcome everybody uh nice to uh to see uh, the people online and i don't see so much the people ah there are the people in the class great there they are yeah um well, I'm very honored uh, to to be asked to 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 give this uh, lecture, and um, uh, I was of course thinking like, okay, what can I share if I'm online trying to explain something that we all do mainly practical? Yeah? So we are really practitioners of self organization in music, and um, of course I want to sort of somehow connect to the to the audience uh, I have at uh, Clea. Uh, but I hope you will find it interesting how I how I set it up. Um, I will. Uh, well, I'm the artistic director of the Genetic Choir, and um, I will tell you about the Genetic Choir and how we work uh, with swarm organization and with evolutionary composition in the ensemble. I'm prepared some slides which I now need to share, and I uh, almost forgot how that happened. How how that works. You see, um, because I first have to. We don't see anything yet. Um, share. Yeah. Like this. Yes, you great. First slide. Yes, yes, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's about singing as a swarm. I mean, that's the title. Um, and that's uh, uh, that's what we do, amongst other things. And uh, a definition of what the genetic choir is, uh, you can see here. It's the attempt to compose music from any imaginable sounds without a central composer or conductor. So the idea is the music emerges from the interaction of the singers. Now, uh, a bit of a fun way to portray that. You could look here. It's... Uh, well, any sounds or silences or bits of music are going into the black box of self-organization by the human singers uh, and out comes quality music. I mean, that's that's the utopian idea. And um, of course, the whole idea of what is music and what is quality, what is good music is very controversial, of course, is especially in uh, experimental music and new music. Um, but we will come to that. How we uh, how we deal with that question in the genetic choir? Um, let's see what oh, what does it work? Yeah, and this is another way of portraying what this whole lecture will be about. Uh, so we we employ evolutionary principles for composing music. Uh, we use swarm principles. What we you know what we know about swarm principles for composing music. And we have the problem of having human agents. Yeah? So we are not birds. We are not DNA that is sort of mutating, selecting itself uh, across generations. We are human singers who want to do this in a group, live on stage, in the same place at that moment. And that uh, uh, creates all sorts sort of questions. And we have been exploring this uh too much uh pleasure and and had headache both like the last 12 years and um so i want to share with you what what actually other things the problems we encounter uh how we approach things and the solutions we found for certain uh problems that arise when you try to do this 
Um, where's my, oh, here's there. Yeah. So what will be the contents of this lecture? Well, what is the genetic why? We just did that. Before we start, I want to just look at this question, what is music? And how we approach that question. I want to give some examples of genetic choir music. I want to explain how we compose. And that will be about emergent behavior versus human behavior. Uh, listening, about listening, about time, texture, meaning as our way of sort of mapping music and sounds. Uh, about evolutionary composing, about swarm composing. And the question, how do we train the singers? So it will also be a little bit about yeah, the, the various voice techniques or, or improvisation techniques that are out there and that have influenced us and how we how we uh, uh, use them. And also about Aikido practice, which might come as a surprise. So this is a Japanese martial art that um, some of you, I mean, I, I guess you know about it. Uh, I will explain a bit how that comes into the uh, genetic choir training as well because it's great training for improvisers to do Aikido practice, I think. Um, this will not be chronologically like this totally. I sort of, I interweaved it so to make it more fun to talk about all these subjects. Well, if there are any questions at any point, please interrupt me or raise a hand or something. Uh, I'm happy to ask, uh, answer questions. And... Um, I understand that also, you know, I, I, I will talk for about an hour and then we there will be ample time to ask questions afterwards also and discuss things. So far, we, I, in... will be, huh? I will be looking at your audience and if there is somebody waving, I will let you know. Okay, okay great. Okay, so before we start, what is music? Um, of course, if you make music, you somehow have to answer this question. Uh, but actually, it's not so interesting to answer the question in a scholarly way for musicians. So usually this is a question that is discussed among musicologists, uh, maybe among, among, among critics of, of music, you know, in newspapers. But for a musician, it's not such an interesting question, because especially if you're interested in new music, anything could be an ingredient for your music. So what is interesting as a musician is much more like, how can we get into an interesting space of music with all the ingredients that I have? And I might, you know, I might depart from known music and I, I use a, a tango or a, another piece of known music. And I think like I, and I add some things like street noises and I, I look at how, how that, what comes out when it, when it cooks together and it, it doesn't matter to me whether street noises are called music or not. I just I just like the idea and I do it. So for a part, this question is redundant. Um, and um, of course, in essence, it's about the question, when does sound become music? Yeah, so you could say that's the big difference. Uh, there are sounds that are not music and then there's music. So just random sounds are not music. But, especially in genetic choir, because we say all sounds imaginable can be part of the music making, you could also say any sounds, yes, any sounds could become or are already music. So, just to picture this as the, as the, as the problem that could come up as a question also amongst uh, singers who train in genetic choir. So, what, what, what do we call music? Well, um, I found uh, a very nice uh, quote from a Belgian philosopher, as far as I know, Silvio Sen, uh, who wrote this. Uh, music is not there to be talked about. It is there to be heard. Just like a painting is there to be seen. However, what seems like a triviality has non-trivial consequences. The purpose of music is to be heard. And that means the music has its original place in the listener's ear. Consequently, not in the game of the performer, the musician, as the circus of virtuosos likes to deceive us. This also applies to the origin of the music in the authorship of the composer. 
The composer is only a composer insofar as he himself is its first listener. And uh, yes, what I like enormously about this quote is uh, that it explains something that is very natural. Huh? We all, everybody experiences music very subjectively. Um, and therefore the music, you're making the music yourself. And of course, this is not a new idea. You also probably know from uh, Marcel Duchamp, uh, who said it's the it's the viewer who makes the painting. C'est le regardeur qui fait le pain, le, le tableau. Uh, so, not the artist is making the music. Yeah. If, if, I, if, if, if I may, there there is a uh, Clément wants to say yeah. something. If... Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, uh, I think it's very reductive this i mean you're starting with a definition of course it it makes sense but i think it's very reductive in the sense that and the, the most pleasurable experiences of music are not just with the ear but by going to a performance by by seeing also the musicians with their body mm -hmm. language by feeling the the real strength of the real sound so i think there is a world of difference between listening to music on a track on spotify and going on the first row of a symphonic orchestra, or, uh, it's it's not at all the same. And seeing all the musicians using their instruments, and uh, so I think this is this is very reductive of what what music is. Oh yeah, I don't mean it exclusively. Huh? So I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. The experience, life experience of music, you know, is it's much more than just the ears. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's in, in principle, the only point to be made is here that the receiver is the composer. Okay? And whether you receive it through your ears or with your whole body or with your eyes, um, it's the, the important part is that it's who, who th those people who, who is to decide what is good music, the receiver of the music is to decide yeah. that it is music or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if I let's see if I can go further, so this is because this may creates a working condition for us in the genetic choir. Uh, we are improvisers, and if we ask what is music, we say the improviser, being his own first listener while playing and singing, decides what music is and what not. Uh, and some people might say, like, well, that's arbitrary. You know, then you could do anything. Um, but I believe it's in fact a very strong commitment that we ask from the improviser. We say, don't play or sing unless you think you yourself think it's music. Um, and, you know, even stronger because we, we at least, you know, we in the genetic are interested in good music. So yeah, what is good music? We are interested in having, having a great experience, but we don't want to define what music is or what could be a great musical experience. So we try to use this definition. We again leave the leave it to the listener, the improviser, the first being his first listener to decide. But we do ask, okay, as your first listener, are you intensely interested in your own music right at this moment? And um, this is a very, you know, this is very strong point or strong point of difference also sometimes with other people who work with improvisation um where in yeah in a lot of contexts of improvisation it's very natural that things can just evolve and become something um and it can be for a time it can be maybe not so interesting and while this as a as a as a global effect of of doing something together is a known process also we had, that, that's very normal i think as an improviser you you need to sort of directly when you start be totally intensely interested in what you're doing so it's not okay to yeah i'm sort of i'm sort of interested you know i'm starting something yeah maybe it becomes something i'm not sure but i could keep going and maybe it becomes something so I say no, no. Go do something and directly be immensely interested. Um, and don't play or sing 
unless you are really now at this moment intensely interested. Well, we come to how this works and how we train this. But this is sort of a first sort of working definition, how we want to uh, create emergent compositions on stage from uh, human agents who are singer improvisers. See? Oh, yeah. Okay, this is again a sort of fun graphic I thought that to make. Because there is, of course, a big problem directly. So uh, this shows the individual singer in the swarm of singers being intensely interested in the music. Mm. But you can sort of feel lost, of course. Yeah? You Imagine you're with five or with 20 singers, you know, any number. Uh, great, I'm interested in my, intensely interested in my music, but there's so much for the rest also happening. So how to do this? How, how to make sense of this swarm, how to be connected, meaningfully connected with all these other singers. Uh, and you could say this is like one of the core core problems or the core challenges of the genetic choir. Let's see? Oh. Yeah, I, so before I go further into the theory, I just wanted to show you actually what are we doing in the genetic choir, just some examples. And just, I will not show you the whole films, uh, three of the films will come back later in a bit more length but just to give you a, a feeling of the scope of things we're doing So we took all these sounds and created a concert later uh, underneath. And I will show you later a bit more of, of this, but just to give you an impression. So this is totally like random music, you could say, from the central station used to create composition. Then there's this other project that was using Christian music, uh, using the Adhan, the, the call for prayer of the Muslims. And using um, uh, actually music from people that they loved, and that could be pop music or it could be any other kind of music uh, in this concert. <laughs> So show you some more of this later. Um, then there's a very different project again, which is the Stem and Leister project, where we go into uh, the closed wards of people in the last phase of dementia to see if we can make contact through our interest in music and in, in using any types of sounds to create meaningful uh, moments together. Okay, also here yeah, I might show you later some more if, if you have time, just to give an impression of what we are all kinds of things that we're interested in. There was also this project about basketball sound, like another version of loop copy mistake.
okay, you get an impression. And I thought I also put this because this is like, you could think like, okay, we are all only doing strange things and strange sounds, but sometimes we also just love to do uh, straight music and combine that with uh, genetic choir. So for example, this was a concert a few years ago and one of the pieces. Uh, wrong one. Okay, um, and uh, it's nice to show this just because workshop, you know, giving workshops is a, also a big part of the choir. And you see here, um, uh, I actually practice. <laughs> name, part of I actually practice that I do in a workshop as well. Přesný vyjádření svých pocitů, myšlenek, záměrů, bez ohledu na předem danou formu. Svoboda v nějaké nesvobodě. Well, I like to work with objects to train improvisation singers. And the, the general reason is that you can train how to make something else more important than yourself. You have to follow the stick, you know, if you want to sort of... Okay, let's, let's not let me talk uh, in the film while you have me here live. But just uh, as an impression of, you know, this all is genetic choir. So you know a bit better what we're, you know, what, what all the coming is about. Any questions until now that you want to ask or that this is not only a monologue? Otherwise, I will just keep going. Improvisace. To je první takový docela velký dobrodružství. What was your very first project that you did? The very first project? Yeah. Well, the very first thing I did was asking uh, singers and actors and dancers that I knew around me to meet in my living room and explore if we could make music without any rules. I mean, that was the very first beginning of genetic choir, you could say. Uh -huh. um, I have a, a question about the basketball experiment. Uh, in this case, I mean, at least what we were listening to were mixed sounds. Yeah. So... Is it still improvisation, or, or is the mixing live, or not, or where, where would you? No, situate? what you what you heard was a was a composed mix for the uh, teaser of the performance. So it was I not see. genetic choir. It was like a laptop artist mixing basketball sounds. Yeah. Okay. And there is a question in the chat. When you, if you click, can quick ah. click on. Was it possible to make music without any rules? Yes. I mean, that's what we keep going, keep doing like for 12 years. Uh, yeah. So it's it's actually still the idea of genetic choir that we make music without any rules. Um, but of course, we have developed a certain way of training. And, and, and that's a, I mean, that's an important uh, uh, yeah, distinction to make, I think. Huh? So we are still interested to not create um composition structures for improvisations no the composition really comes from the interaction of the singers but we do train uh, certain attitudes of the singers how to be an agent in this self-organizing situation of making music without any rules and this is what i will talk about now so this is a perfect bridge uh the next slide Thomas, another question. Zlatka, yeah. if you could uh, grab the, the mic, okay? Because Well, my question is in connection with your third project and what you said in the beginning, that uh, you should have an intense interest in making music and then you are working with patients in the last stage of uh, dementia. I don't connect those two together. So uh, naturally, I had some thoughts about the ethics of doing uh, 
experiment like that because these are definitely not people that can give consent. And how do you define then also intense interest in it? So mm. you explain. It's a very good question. Um I'm I'm just wondering whether we should talk about this when I come to the uh to the to the to showing the whole video. Uh Mm, but it is it is indeed it's a question eh? i could just very shortly say it's it's a question in how far are you uh what is more ethical eh, to 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 come into these places to see if you can make an interaction without words with these people uh because these are places where actually most of these people are given up on to make you know verbal conversation because they can't make verbal conversation anymore so you also can't ask verbally consent to them. Uh, um, but the problem is you can then decide to stay away. I can't ask them whether they really enjoy me being here. Um, so I better stay away. But actually, then I'm depriving them also of uh, a meaningful uh, contact that I, I'm bringing in a situation, you know, they are living in, yeah, words where they are there's very little meaningful interaction um and of course the question whether we are too much always sort of is part of how how we are in in the room and how we are sensing uh the residents and so if somebody you know i feel from somebody's body language or from somebody's energy uh that that you know he they she he doesn't want me to approach her or to keep singing or to start any kind of interaction of course i stay away i uh, in that sense we are looking for uh of course consent for the interaction but it's not as clear-cut indeed it's a it's a, it's a it's an interesting ethical problem um let's maybe come back to that oh do you want to about yeah? the intense interest how do you define that then? I well, mean, it's very important. They are intensely interested. Well, it, it's about the improviser. Eh? So I'm, uh, and especially in this project, you know, we don't want to become carers. We don't want to become, uh, we want a um, equal relationship with the human uh, uh, in front of us. So I need to be, I need to be intensely interested in this moment. Um, uh, if I'm just doing this in order to help someone or to care, I think that would be the, the wrong attitude. Uh, and of course, the, the, I mean, my own, mm, I don't need to sort of do my thing there. You know, I don't need to do crazy sounds just for myself. No, I'm listening and I'm getting intensely interested in, for example, the sounds of someone even if those sounds are like, yeah, like, uh, uh. you know, there are really people who can only do this. Uh, uh. And, and it's, it's a, wow, it's such a challenge to sort of think and, 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 and listen and wait and see where, how can I, you know, enter into a meaningful interaction on music or on sound uh, in such a situation. Uh, but the same applies still. I'm, 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 I'm trying to listen. And, and what do I hear? Not yet. What, what, where is there an entrance towards, towards musical interaction? I think like it can be indeed interesting for this. I mean, it depends on how to make this connect, uh, connection with this person. But I was thinking also about the consent on putting this on YouTube. Like these people cannot really give consent on like being online. So how does yeah but we asked of course we also thought about that and we we asked uh, we asked them if we if we could if they can still uh understand the question and and and, and we showed them but we also asked uh, they have um uh, what is it for family members or people who are legally their guardians and, uh, and they gave the consent yeah it's an interesting, it's very interesting question because I understand your concerns, uh, but we also, it's also this thing like if you don't, we also made beautiful pictures of them, for example. Um, and you could say like, yeah, they can't give consent, uh, but then actually you're hiding them. You're also, 
you're 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 also giving them not the opportunity to be in this world and to be present in their being um if you just say like yeah let's not let's not show it let's not show them because they can't give consent anymore uh, so we try to do it as ethically as possible but seeing that you know both choices uh can be difficult yeah. very interesting conversation maybe we can sort of discuss later if there's more interest in discussing this yeah let's yeah. show for now the one or did i hear uh... oh just go ahead go ahead yeah um so how does this work ah yes Uh, 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 uh. Okay, so there is this thing of emergent behavior versus human behavior. Um, and it's very essential sort of yeah question when bringing evolutionary concepts or swarm concepts into a group of humans to see like what happens. Um, so the basic idea of the genetic choir is that composition, or you could call it higher order musical structures, appear from the emergent behavior of the group organism rather than from one ordering mind, which would be a composer or a conductor, or from a conscious trading of musical ideas uh, on a social level between the singers. So what do I mean with the conscious trading of musical ideas? It's that, uh, for example, in traditional jazz, you have this jazz combo idea like, okay, you now can get a solo and I will do the bass line and I will do the background for a while. And then after a while, I will get a solo uh, to do something with the musical material. And this is, um, this is uh, you could call it a social trading uh, of, um, you know, giving each other roles and changing roles, switching roles. Um, but it's a rather conscious way of doing that. Um, and in order to allow for the complex musical layers and transitions that we're looking for in genetic choir, uh, as well as unexpected split second turns in the music, uh, I think the emergent behavior of the system organism needs to be allowed to be the decision maker and not the conscious decision of any of the singers to go there with the music or go that direction with the music. Um, oh. So uh, a group of humans negotiating their musical ideas with each other on a conscious level would be, uh, from our experience, much too slow. Uh, and it will, will, will be, yeah, so it, it will be a totally different way of interacting, which I don't think is is uh, close to what uh, swarm behavior is or what emergent behavior is in an ecological sense, in an evolutionary sense. Um this doesn't mean that human engagement and musical intuition is not welcome and needed. It is welcome and needed. And so I need the human musical intuition of all the singers, but I, I, I need it on the local, not on the global interactions in the music. Um, in order for the global higher order musical structures to emerge. And I'll explain about that a bit more. Let's see. Yeah, there are some central required strategies. So one is training deep listening and the understanding of micro level aspects of music um, for the macro effects to em effects to emerge. Training to make ch musical choices locally, what I just said, not globally, for the global effects to emerge. And training to disregard the social level intentions, thoughts, feelings that can arise while singing together as much as possible. Um, which just means that uh as soon as the um, we as singers sort of start reacting on each other in a social way during singing because i for example i think like you were singing something i don't really like so i'm um i'm as a singer opposing that on a on a social relation level um uh, the music will not be any more the focus uh of our uh, self-organizing system so we want the music the sounds to be to be uh to 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 be the focus of the of the self-organization and not the um yeah the actions of singers who make 
you make who make choices uh, with each other on a social level. Now, this is of course best is problematic because we also ask people to use their musical intuition to be fully there with their own voice and allow their voice to be heard. Um, so it's a it's a sort of touchy touchy thing, but it actually just means that from our experience while improvising, uh, if I get a thought about someone in the group, it's much better for me to just disregard that thought and focus again on the music rather than following that thought and and, and putting my energy into, into what I think about people, for example. So this is what this uh, what I, what we try to do. Um, yes, so and I want to do one thing practically with you, if you don't mind. Let's listen together. Um, oh, wait, wait a second, are you still there? Yeah. Um, because that's what we can do in all in our environments, and then we can talk about how we see music actually. So I would um, propose that you uh, rub your hands a little bit where you are. You want to join me with rubbing your hands? And then put them on your eyes and listen to all the sounds around you. We will do that for like half a minute or a minute. Listen to all the sounds in your environment now. Okay, until here, then take your hands off your eyes. And I'm just curious to gather, so were there any sounds that sparked your interest from when listening? Can we gather any sounds that sparked your interest uh, in terms of being intensely interested? Was there anything that stood out? What did you hear? I heard someone's stomach. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and did you like that sound? Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. I heard someone breathe and I know who that was too. <laughs> yes. So you directly had a picture of that person from the sound. Well, yeah. I mean, face here so I can orient myself and just hear where the sound comes from. I'm yeah. sure I know where the sound is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else? Any other sounds that sparked your interest? Oh, there was a background sound. Which I liked. Yeah. Say it again, what was it? Yeah, some kind of... Like a technological humming or in the background. Machines. Yes, okay. I, I can't. Yes, sir. I cannot hear the conversation of the people in the room so well, but yeah, there was a humming. You, if you take the, the mic when you are speaking. Uh, it's unusually quiet here in this room because usually we have seminars in another room where there are always pretty loud students passing in front of the window. And now <laughs> we didn't hear any. Okay. So the absence of those sounds actually was what you heard. <laughs> yeah. That's expectation. That's nice. Um, and the and the humming that was mentioned, like who who said that? Uh, what, what was interesting about it? Like was there was there an interest for you in that sound? Yeah, it was comforting. I mean, it was like there. Yeah. It was just like a background. Very yeah. Subtle. 
Okay, so I would like to do it one more time with a certain instruction now. Um, I would like to you to listen again to all the sounds and uh, listen um, what in the sound interests you, that is one. Like, is there something about the, I call it texture of the sound. So for example, this humming, is there something about that Go if you listen into the sound that that excites you, that interests you, or it could be that the humming has a certain rhythm, a certain pulse, and you, or you hear something else that has a time aspect, and which means you are interested in the timing of that sound. So I had here something. All of a sudden, there was, um, uh, um, I think, wood or something falling on this terrace, and it was sort of good, and. It, it was an event that was in time very interesting. It was just, ah, it happened and, and it excited me, not so much because of the sound itself, but because of the timing of it. So rhythm or timing could be another thing. And the third one is meaning. And meaning, you know, that is actually when you think, oh yeah, oh, this was uh, um, uh, this person breathing. Or if you, if you what was it, what, what did we have? Oh yeah, the, the, the stomach. Uh, you heard, oh, it's a stomach talking um, or even oh it's comforting it's also a feeling it's something that gives you something that the sound gives you but it's not the sound itself yeah so sound itself time aspect of the sounds around you or meaning these three things have another listen just one more time Okay, until here. You can let go of your hands. Tell me anything, gather gathering experiences. People were making per uh, sounds on purpose. Just ah. No. <laughs> and what did as, that do? As if it sounded like as if accidentally, but it was clearly on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but that yeah, okay. So that was interesting. You you heard that it was on purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. meant to to sound as accidental. So it was yeah. a complex situation. <laughs> but which means that you have had thoughts about it, which I would call category meaning. Any yeah, any other yeah. things that you listen to, and that yeah. you could put in one of these categories of yeah. experience. Uh, then at that point, I think it's a it's a. I mean, it's meaning, sure. But it's different to posit a mind behind something. That's not just any old meaning, any old symbol. But, you you know, like I had a sense, I actually had a sense that there is a mind behind every sound this time. And I thought, like, I, I, I heard this technological humming and I thought, okay, and they are, they are, they are saying, okay, now you notice us. <laughs> yes, all those, uh, all those, like, whatever they are, yes, those like, shh, and you normally don't notice them. You'd only notice those technological things when they stop working. And it's like so sad as a way of existing. You only are noticed when you when you don't work. 
and now we listen to them and i thought okay yes i hear you yeah you're here so like the, in terms of the mind like i was all of a sudden hearing the minds everywhere mm. <laughs> but matter that sounds yeah, it sounds like little like like angels almost <laughs> okay interesting <laughs> but the humming you have in your room is that about the humming still yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yes, a comment about the humming because it's a, a very regular sound. The brain is can very easily erase it. Yeah. It's like yeah. a background sound that the brain can easily. Uh, otherwise, I like the the texture the texture of a sound of a scratch of a bag that mm. that went open. I think oh yeah, it was an interesting, very interesting texture actually. Yeah, thank you. Other experiences of listening? Well, actually, the second time round, I liked the humming less in a way, not that I liked it less, but it got boring. Maybe mm. because it's such a background, maybe what Clement just said, it's such a kind of a background thing. Okay, in the beginning, it's comforting. To me, it was comforting because in the sudden silence, there was something. So it was mm. kind of a sign of life of something so it's comforting but now i already kind of assumed it's there so uh -huh. okay yeah. it's there yeah. shut up <laughs> so i i had i had exactly the opposite yeah. <laughs> like relationship <laughs> with, with that but maybe you noticed it now no i did the notice i did notice it but time. now it kind of like became more meaningful and speaking okay. to me and also you know it's so unfair okay i, I don't know why i'm <laughs> I'm, I'm not uh, when you are uh, when you are a very steady presence all the time there uh you like people's brains filter you out because you you see like it's uh, okay i don't know why i'm getting you know political all of a sudden yeah. <laughs> Just, okay but it's, it's not fair. yeah, yeah it, I totally it's, i totally get get you oh sorry yeah. no no it's it's about predictability if your if your brain can extremely well predict what will happen next and like with a humming sound then it doesn't get interesting anymore whereas if you do a oh, oh certainly... we, we rely so much on those things being continuously present like oxygen yes and uh oh what and others like gravity okay, okay but let's, let's yeah, but it's like but it's like it's like angels no like we filter our angels all the time like we barely <laughs> yeah sure exactly the same <laughs> exactly okay. the same as angels <laughs> then let me let me let me because there's so many angels sorry. yeah sorry there's so many beautiful things being said but i just want to reframe it in the context of what we're talking about or what yeah. you know i would like to present so so it's it's really nice to hear all these different experiences and um it's very natural what uh uh the guy in the corner, I can't see you, Phil. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, it's very natural that we filter out sounds that we take for granted. Uh, and um, But we can also choose to listen deeper into the sounds. So what the effect I heard from Marta when she started talking about that she felt the presence of the sounds much more, it sounded like you heard the texture of that sound much more. Uh, uh, and then you know you had these thoughts about it about uh, its existence or being an entity, but that that would be again meaning. But there is this moment that you sort of not just take it for granted, but you listen deeper into it, and it becomes you know the the sound itself becomes more three dimensional and more interesting to listen to. And in the same way, um, you know, a rhythmical aspect could be something that you that sparks your interest, and it's those two like the texture and the time aspect are two ways to get out of um making a uh and getting into the musical experience and out of the thought experience uh, in the end you know uh getting images about the thoughts uh, about the music can you can also use as an improviser but usually it does also take you out of the actual listening so once you made a label on it you know whether that is uh, an image you get in your head or a, a word or you think like oh that's a dog uh, you you stop listening or you oh oh that's that's the air conditioning um and 
so one of the things to 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 do as an improviser, if you think like I get bored, there, there's nothing anymore here to be heard, is to, for example, did I hear everything about the texture of the sound yet? And when you do that, you will hear more. I mean, that's that's the experience of in all the workshops that I give and in my own experience from doing this for 12 years, your ears will hear more and the space, the listening space will become bigger than you thought it was. There are more sounds to be heard than you think because indeed we filter out most of the sounds that we hear every day and we label them and say like, oh, that's that. And then we don't listen anymore to it uh, uh, in detail. So this is one of the things that uh, let me come back to my to the slides. Um, where are they? Sorry, I'm getting lost on my computer here. Um, so this is what I just uh, ask you to do: to to listen to the aspect of time or texture or meaning in the sounds around you. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, any sound or any music has all these aspects. You know, it's not that something is only time or something is only texture. No, it, it always, it's always a sound that itself has a texture uh, and that could be pitch or its volume or uh, other things that are about the sound itself. Uh, it's always in time, spaced in time, has a certain moment to start and a moment to end connected with other sounds in time. And it also continually produces meaning in the listener. Huh? So there is all the time associations or feelings about it that the sounds produce and that we attach to the sound. Actually, my ears are whistling since a week. And so that's <laughs> the only thing I hear. Oh and my it's God. really very annoying in the silence. <laughs> I, I can imagine. <laughs> so I don't like these exercises. And it's really, it has no, it has only got time. It has no meaning. It's got no texture. It's just annoying. And it, because it's, it's taking all the time. Yeah, of course. Meaning. The meaning is annoying. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, I don't like that kind of meaning. <laughs> if you call that a meaning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a good example because it's really it's one of it's a feeling by the sound. But of course, you know, it's terrible to do this exercise if you have that. You know, of, of course, you know, we will not do it again. It was just to to get us into the heart of things, um, because then uh, we could talk about how we sort of try as genetic choir to talk about the aspects of music or of sound. Um, without using any particular um yeah musicological uh, tradition yeah? because of course there are there is there is the classical music there is indian music there is there are lots of different styles and lots of different ways how music is being taught on conservatoria uh, in principle the genetic choir you know lives by the idea like anybody could join uh because we, you don't need any background in any understanding of music. But when we then do it, of course, it's useful to be able to talk about it and to, to explore different parts of uh, music, of sound experiences. So that's why we use this time texture meaning. And just to give you this overview, texture aspects are pitch, volume, timbre, uh, which is the sound color or the resonance. Um, and it's a very complicated, yeah, term. And I mean, it's used in all different sorts of schools also a little bit differently. We use it as purely everything that makes the sound, uh, uh, resonate in your mouth cavity, in your nose cavity above the vocal cords. Uh, because if you sing an A, uh, R, it sounds totally different from an E. So that's just the mouth shape changing your vowel, but it also changes the timbre. Um, mm -hmm. usually. And in classical music, for example, you try to not change the timbre when you th sing, sing a different vowel. Um, so this is sound color and resonance. And then we also have friction effects, which are all the extra effects you can do with air friction, like <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, these are all is not 
resonance, but it's a it's a friction of uh, I put something into the airflow from my lungs in order to create an effect. And uh, well, sorry, probably there are more. Probably there are more texture aspects, but we use these four as a general feeling. Okay, we talk about this, we talk about this. Um, time aspects um, are, for example, tempo, phrasing, uh, timing in terms of pause, which which means like when do you start the next sound uh, in the pause after the pause? When do you pause? Timing in terms of shift is how my music is timed towards a different singer's music. And we also use add or shed as one one training method that is about, yeah, if you just, if you have a rhythm and you take something out of the rhythm or you add something to that rhythm, the rhythm changes, for example. And that means time changes because you add or shed. And uh, a question, uh, you I guess you would put harmony in the texture aspects? Yeah, so harmony, yes, absolutely. Like, you mean to, uh, like an interval uh, of tones uh, sounding at the same time? Yes, like, yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Chords. Well, Thomas, could you could you give an example of a different color of sound? A different, so that would be timbre? Yeah. Uh, well, for example, if I do... Uh, I keep the same pitch, but I make this tone more nasal. You heard that through the microphone? Uh, what? Why do you call it color? Though? Well, yeah, you could call it anything. Like timbre. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Timbre is the difference. You know, also you could. It's also explained easily if you say like the, uh, if you play a note on a piano, it sounds different from a note on the contrabass. It's uh -huh. the same pitch, but the resonance chamber where the mm. sound is uh, is a different shape and it creates a different color it creates a different has different warmth you know for example mm. uh, yeah and i'm going up in pitch but i could try to stay on the uh. same and make it more sharp the sound or make it more 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 warm uh -huh. um, so that these are examples of timbre or sound color very interesting Did that answer your question could you use this uh oh, maybe that's what you do and uh, to ask the improvisators to think about these three fundamental aspects and when somehow the improvisation is stuck to try to work on one of these or maybe there is already an interesting texture an interesting pitch volume or whatever then to work on the on the time on the rhythm and Oh, I mean to play like this. Yes, yes, you, you're you're sort of pointing exactly in the right direction of how we use this. Um, and I I uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't really put it in exactly in that way. But but what what we for example say like so if you're not interested if you if you if you have you you want to be directly interested in what you're doing. I'm starting something. For example, and I'm. Sort of, yeah, I'm already interested, but I'm not really sure what exactly it is. Then I could think like, okay, is it now, is it about the texture? It's this, it's, it's the difference in two tones that is really interesting me, something about the texture, or is it something about the time that is really interesting me? Or is it the meaning because it sounds like something? And I could in that way uh, sharpen the definition of what I'm doing. Yes, more questions about this, or shall I move further? Let's I think see. I think this will become clearer when you get to the to, to talk more about the like how you compose with this, no? Like in the in the next slides with like how do you get into yeah. self organization and so yes. on. Exactly. So this is actually the base and indeed this this is how I can explain the next things better. Uh, so one thing we do is this concept of evolutionary composing. And we so we see sounds as a gene pool of very DNA from which music can evolve. Uh, so this is also, you know, that's the basic idea also why we 
found this name, genetic choir. Uh, the evolution has produced all these great organisms in various shapes. Can we, in a much quicker uh, cycling of generations, generations of sound, create different sorts of music, different sorts of compositions? So we see the bits of sound as sound DNA, which is first selected by the singers, then copied by the singers. And in this process, because in the copying, natural mutations occur, uh, be, because, you know, you don't hear exactly right or because your voice is a bit different from the voice of the person next to you. We all have different vocal apparatus. There's always some difference. Uh, mutations occur and those mutations can feed the next singer to 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 copy that mutation and in this way you know there's a new selection made a new copy is made that rotates again so this is how the process works very simply um now how do we train this for example uh just to give an example we have this instant copy as an exercise which is two singers that copy each other's sound and musical material instantly and as closely as possible which is um, yeah, the, which is which is not a leader follower exercise because it really happens instantly. Um, so you have a soloist and a twin, how we call it, and the twin really tries to be the soloist directly and instantly. And of course, there's some sometimes that this doesn't work, but actually, if you train this, you are really spot on in having a sort of sixth sense of what the other wants to do, and you direct can be directly together. Um, and later you can say like, okay, there's no soloist anymore. You just, both of you start, you want to copy each other. You very quickly go to unisono, uh, having one material, but still then when you try to be totally unisono, there will be small deviations, mutations, at least on the micro level of the music. For example, you know, a different timbre because I have a different voice resonance uh, in my body than the person next to me, even if we try to do the same thing. And on these mutations, on the diff on these differences, the the dynamic of the select copy mutate can drive, and the music can develop. I have a, a remark yes. um, that this is not doing. It's uh, the concept of conversation in music that you have one musician answering to another, and so they could be doing very different things, not copying, not mutating but just di creating a dialogue between each other. Yes, which we also do. I mean, this is not the only principle we, we, we employ. Okay, I see. It's just, it's just one, of the, one of the ways we work. Huh? So I just want to give an idea how we use this evolutionary principle. Uh, I forgot something. Oh, yeah. You could do this, this instant copy first best with like, just long tones, carpets of sound or repeating rhythms because then you both feeling like you're we're together but then later it's interesting to train this with really yeah a musical phrase or even you know someone starting a song and the other person being together in that song and then mutations occur um now two examples of how to start these kind of evolutionary compositions uh, which again is not the only thing we do but this we find amongst other things very interesting uh one option is to have one seed uh, so from silence, one singer starts with a specific piece of music or sound, and all the other singers copy, join in in copying with the idea of only doing the same thing. But of course, mutations will occur, and that will drive the music in a certain direction, because some people might also stay with a with a mutated sound, so they might become two groups. Like some people stay with the original seed more, and others follow a certain mutation. Um, and others follow maybe another mutation if you have a big group. And that's one seed. And you can also do this with many seeds, which you could say is start from chaos. Everybody starts with his own musical material. And then the idea of this evolutionary composition is that you take over sound aspects of other seeds around you. And so I might, uh, I might, uh, sing a certain melody. And next to me, somebody is is making a rhythm. And yeah, well, the easiest thing, like what happens in music all the time, is that I take the pulse of that rhythm and adjust my melody so it falls in the same pulse. 
Yeah, so I take a sound aspect included into my DNA of my sound, and uh, from there we go forward. Um, but it could be also more subtle. I stay in a different rhythm, but I just take uh, um, a texture aspect of the rhythm next to me, and I'm not adjusting in uh, rhythm, for example. Uh, so this is another way we can apply this principle to interesting effects. Now, what is really important or what proved to be really important to get good results <laughs> is uh, to have stable seeds. And what do we mean with stable seeds in this uh, sense is clarity and definition in the sound or musical phrase of each individual singer. Um, so it really, it really turns out that this is a prerequisite for the system to work. Um, and that is because if I don't hear clearly what my fellow singers are doing, if they are sort of, yeah, starting something, but, you know, just sort of swimming, exploring sounds, and they're not defining their seed, they're not defining their musical space that they're bringing in, I cannot get into a relationship with them. You know, I could sort of take something out of what I hear, but I actually can't sort of put my my musical thing next to that musical thing in a in a way that makes sense because the other is not yeah the other doesn't have give me any clear boundaries of of uh, or any clear navigation uh ah you're there i'm here i hear that person there i hear that person there okay from here now we can trade uh musical aspects and we understand that we are on this positions and our positions might change but we need to have an understanding of where are our musical positions in respect to each other in order to be able to work together in this way. So this is also already one of the most important you know, parts of the training um, because definition and clarity is often a challenge for improvisation singers. Uh, Sorry, Thomas, why, can I ask a question? Yes. Why do you call that a stable seed? Stable to me means i would my immediate association would mean that it doesn't change yeah it doesn't sound like it's not what you're saying no you're right it's not uh, uh, uh the point is that that from the first beginning i want to hear a stability i want to hear the musical space even if there are six singers at the same time doing different things i want to hear those six positions clearly uh, and then from that moment on those seeds can change indeed you know and we can we could go anywhere but if we don't have this clarity in the beginning it's really really hard to create uh, um to, to create the self organizing system to 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 make choices because the starting position is is too vague for sure i mean that's that's a kind of that's a propagation of can one can say there's a propagation of information and in the, if that information isn't clear then yeah, what's propagated isn't going to be clear. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, you could ask if we say like, okay, uh, we, we talk about sound DNA, but what is actually like one piece of sound DNA? Because it could be one tone. Could you also be a series of tones? Um, it could be a whole recognizable melody. It could be a series of strange sounds, a certain rhythm. Um and this is exactly sort of, it's, this is exactly what we want. We want, we don't want to define what is one unit of music or one unit of sound. We want the singer to decide that. The improviser can decide it, but it has to be decided. Uh, so if I, if I do, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, I I'm, do a few sounds and I repeat them, but I don't really make a choice. Is it like a clearly repeating rhythm of these sounds or is it, what is it about? Maybe I should, I think from what I just did, I think I should just take out two sounds and, 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 and do fewer sounds and in that way create more clarity and more definition. But if I can handle such a long melody as a singer, it could be also become very clear. Okay, this is my 
this is my piece of sound. It has this length and it's very clear and very stable. This is my proposition. And so the unit of sound could be any length. Right? Also, <coughs> could be my unit of sound. Um, it could be a rhythm. It could be a melody. But you have to decide as a singer uh, what you're proposing. And that, and creating that clarity is really, uh, it re really requires training. Is there, is there a, a kind of rule of, of thumb of uh, um, what brings clarity, like repeating, I don't know, three times, five times, the uh, same phrase, sound, before it gets caught up, or, or it really depends? Or, I, mean, I mean, experimentally, have you, have you uh, noticed that there needs to be a certain amount of repetition before it's um, caught up by others? Well, ideally not. Uh, so this comes back to this question, like, are you directly intensely interested in your music or do you think it might become something? Of course, in training this, you know, you might need some time to understand, ah, okay, this is my thing. And it might take 10 seconds or 20 seconds by repeating something. But ideally, you know, where you want to get to uh, and with the, pro with the genetic choir singers with which I do the performance projects, You know, you you just start and directly that in the first few seconds you define by singing. You define and you make you make you make clear. Okay, it's just this, um, and there shouldn't be too much searching or repeating in order to get there. Um, one help for define for finding this definition is the practice of phrasing. So maybe that is also partly answering this question. Um, we talk about phrasing, a musical phrase uh, um, with any sound or series of sounds as long as it's defined with a clear beginning, duration and end. Uh, so this could also be a repeating rhythm uh, and then the rhythm phrase is just looped so it's, it's continuous or a single tone. Uh, so da we also call this a phrase. It could be a phrase because I decide to stop there. I might take a pause and then I might sing it again. And this is, you know, this is something that is, you know, we really would, should do this in a workshop setting, but uh, it's, it's such a central concept to create definition uh, because it actually asks of the singers to make the existence of their sounds count. You know, it really, it, 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 it starts, it has a life, it has a bow, It has a tension and it comes to a clear end. You, you make a full stop to your sentence to make your point. Uh, and the beginning or the ending could also be of very different quality. So a full stop doesn't have to be like an abrupt ending. It, a full stop can also be a fade out or a... Uh, 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 uh. And there it ends. You know, it could be all kinds of qualities of endings as long as it, you make it very clear, that's that's my phrase, that's the end of it, and after that there's a pause, and then I start might start a new phrase. Um, oh, a second. Yeah, and silence after a phrase is really essential for actually letting your music land. It's another thing that you, you know, you would experience in, in workshops. Uh, it's so essential to take that moment after you sing a phrase and let it sink in what you just did, it really strengthens the definition. And that goes beyond, you know, a musical definition. It, it really is about like, what did it mean to you? Uh, what, what sort of, what is other repercussions of having si sung this? Um, and it's a really good training to avoid, you know, continuously producing new sounds, which is one of the big, you know, problems I experience with improvisation. Uh, just there are continuously things being produced rather than something is produced and it actually stands there and it has a really strong ex existence and I can relate to it. Um, I'm just trying to sort of look at the time, whether I want, want you, do you want to see a little bit more of this project? Um, yeah, sure. Yes, yeah. because it's interesting to to show that we um, so we 
we get out all these sounds, then took people to workshop. So what you see here, uh, we gather sounds from the central station by doing sound walks with uh, audiences and ask them, what, what, what do you find interesting sounds? And then we ask them to sing those sounds with their own voice, to so copy them with their own voices. And we made a database and this database of sounds we used on the night of performance. And that is what you're seeing here. On the night of performance, there were several workshops in which people could, you know, try out some of these sounds from the databases and in different ways um, mutate them, change them, or put them together in a certain way. And what this group of people then together decided became the starting point for the uh, compositions of the musicians later. So later on the same <laughs> we'll get the compositions. Uh, so this is very simple. We take the audio that we, the audience has given us and we try to copy it and we try to develop it uh, later in the piece. Uh, and then uh, more things we did here. But one thing that is especially interesting is that at some point we also asked the audience to um, help us in making the right decisions in the uh, composing. And uh, let me see which... On 847. Uh, and they did what they had hand signs for what I was just explaining to you about time texture meaning. So there was uh, a hand sign for time, a hand sign for texture, and a hand sign for meaning. And the idea was not that they would, um, they would, the idea was not that they would, um, uh, direct us or conduct us but they would say as an active audience member ah, now I'm hearing something in terms of texture that really interests me so they were showing us their intense interest to a certain aspect of the music that we were making and as a singer I could decide I do something with that oh I, oh, I didn't hear that I, I will go that direction or I could also decide like okay interesting that you hear that but I'm busy on another road so i could also ignore it so it was clearly not a yeah a conducting but it was sharing with the audience the listening that we do ourselves as improvisers while we do it so i will just show you a little bit of it
okay, so far, maybe. Um, okay, any questions about uh, this uh, video? Sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was a very, very nice project, like combining audience and their experience of sound with, you know, our way of dealing with it and trying to bring them into our process in a way. Um, so for time, maybe, oh, I'm, yeah, what if I want to do something else? Uh, let's see, where if I'm here? Um, uh, because I talked about uh, evolutionary composing and from this idea, okay, I have to copy and I can mutate, but what if I want to do something else? I also want to do something else. I don't want to copy. Of course, that is possible. But we found out through the years of, you know, trying this, that then actually another, yeah, another approach to 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 self-organization is very useful as a picture, as a metaphor. And that, of course, is the bird of swarms. Oh, no, wait. Let's, what was this? Oh, yeah, this is also interesting to just say first. Um, because when you say, like, I want to do my own thing, um, it also touches... Uh, like a, a dichotomy in how we, you know, we approach music in the genetic way. We say all sounds are possible. And also, you know, we're interested in you, you know, really singing your own music, bringing out your own voice. So as well, the more intuitive or holistic approaches to the voice are interesting for us because they really, you know, they train authenticity of the voice, you know, as far as you could say something like that, that, uh, we want to so for example if you don't i don't know if you know them but roy hart uh, uh the roy hart uh, uh method or lichtenberger method is a german uh form of uh, looking at the voice and any free expressive voice work you know in many forms like there are many ways that that work for okay sing and let your voice you know be itself and and through that you know, also make your voice more voice more resonant and more connected. You're singing more connected to your to yourself. Uh, so if you're singing a song, uh, how can it be really expressive of your feelings? Uh, so this is all very very useful work. And then there is the other side, which are the technical approaches to the voice, and some of them are very interesting for us. Uh, um, uh, because as I said, we don't want to go for a certain tradition of. Uh, singing training like classical or like jazz um but there are for example the still voice technique and also the complete vocal technique are two yeah two techniques that attempt a sort of completeness of the human voice so they they and they explain it in a very technical way so they say like okay if you want to create um a grunt in combination to a long tone you have to do this with your uh, with your muscles and um uh you know they they attempt to sort of be able to to do all styles of music and and all possibilities of the voice and in themselves these are much too you know sophisticated things to use in genetic choir because you you know you would have to train everybody in one of these techniques in order for them to be able to do that but uh like information from these techniques really of course, are part of how we how we use this. Uh, for example, how we talk about texture and to create changing pitch without changing the sound color at the same time, or changing the volume without changing uh, the the pitch at the same time. Uh, usually, if you sing lower, a lower tone, you also sound a bit softer. And so, you want to sort of get agile and and want to train your instrument. That is that is the voice next to connecting it to your yeah to your soul to your to your being uh, so both approaches are really uh, part of genetic choir and um so and when we come to this question what if i want to do something else i really want to express myself yeah of course you can express yourself so you can be a free bird um but you can also swarm and that's the nice thing about this picture of the bird and the swarm it's of course the question how to be autonomous and at the same time meaningfully connected with others and well this is what all of you know of course the picture of swarming birds it's an often used metaphor for swarm organization of course 
Um, and for us, it works like this. So we say birds are free. Huh? So you could be free, but you can also swarm. And you know birds in a swarm, they are adjusting their movement in the sky according to the movement information they receive from their direct neighbors. Huh? So speed, direction, and distance towards each other. Um, and in genetic choir, we are we're saying we're adjusting our actions in the music according to the sound information we receive from our fellow singers. Um, and this is very interesting, especially because birds operate in a three-dimensional space, and that is rather overseeable, you could say. You know, they are just these three variables, uh, three dimensions of space. But how many dimensions do we have in a musical space? You know, it's 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 almost, yeah, you can't count it. I don't know if anybody has a suggestion, but in our experience, you know, there are so many possible ways you could map music uh, that it's not very clear how to navigate in a musical space. So again... It's very clear. You, you just need texture, meaning... <laughs> Yeah, time takes meaning. That's the solution. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so we use these container words, but of course they are not enough. You know, they are not enough. You have to sort of be more precise about where you are with your music. Um, so you need to choose at each moment on which dimensions or aspects of the music you want to align with your singers next to you. Huh? So if you think we are singers as a bird swarm of birds, I'm now aligning on the rhythm. So I'm now aligning on uh, the pitch or the distance is in a certain pitch. You do this tone, I do this tone. We're staying together, but we keep connected through uh, the same timbre that we're using. Or, you know, so you have to constantly, you know, navigate on micro aspects of the music. I mean, that's at least what we train and what works very, very well in our experience. And a, a, a question about the swarm analogy, which I think is very useful indeed. Um, do in the choir, do you have these clusters that form around certain um, melodies, certain sounds? Like, I mean, five, 10 people doing the same thing and then five, 10 people doing other things. Uh, because like in birds you would have uh you can have swarms that that go away from the main swarm and and then come back and do dynamics like this yes yeah yeah, yeah. so we have the same situation so if we are with eight singers uh we might start uh as one group feeling like we're all in the same musical space uh doing different things but it's it's really one thing and then it starts shifting and we might sort of it turns out to be two groups uh, and make two kinds of music next to each other that still somehow fit, but they are really clearly two different spaces, two different musical spaces. And then they exist for a while next to each other and then they might melt again. So it, it, it's comparable. You could, you could say, yes. Uh, a, a question also I had about the swarm. One of the properties of swarm behaviors is that actually the, the birds who are leading the direction of the swarm are actually the most egoistic. They are because they are the ones who don't follow the rules of others. So they are not followers. They become leaders because they they don't look very much at the others. They do whatever they want, and the others because they have this pro pre-programmed rule of following others. Then they will tend to fo to follow the the most egoistic, the the one that goes in, in his own way. So. Do you is have that something? In reality how it works? Is that the biological explanation? They are egoistic birds. I don't know. Eh? I yes, don't... yes, yes, yes. And it's in. Uh, you can look in uh, in the into the models of swarm behaviors, and and so the the people who model this, they they can change the um, the parameters of each bird and and say um, this one will copy. Uh, I don't know. 80% of the time, the, uh, the behavior of others, of the neighbors, or it will copy only 5% of the time. And ah. it's it's uh, the one that copies the least that becomes the leader. 
Yeah, the the name. I, I call it egoistic because the name because egoistic it, is kind of for dramaturgy of the of the story, yes. Because you can you can call it variation simply. <laughs> no, no, in real bird, it's uh, yes, different birds will have different propensity to to follow others or not. Yeah. But it's nice that you mentioned it because, in fact, that's the same thing with singers, of course. You and also, it's it can be different and different moments in the music. So I might start out with a musical idea that I feel very strongly about, and I just sort of stick to it. Although around me there are other propositions, and I just sort of relate myself to the other propositions without changing my thing. And that might mean that other people start following me or start blending into my music because of that. But later in the same piece, I could become very interested in something that someone else is doing, and therefore I am becoming a sort of follower for a moment. And uh, so, yeah, it's I, much more I, dynamic in this way. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me see for time also to go through this. Um... Uh, well, this is just again training uh, with the instant cop. We train. The soloist trains to be really clear about their material and intensely interested. The twin trains to be completely available. Huh? And um, what is uh, 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 when you have these two extremes, uh, you, you, you train the egoistic soloist uh, and the totally available twin. Uh, you, have, you train these two extremes and then you can go to more subtle relationships. So, for example, you can do both the same thing, copy, but you start to differ on one dimension, like timbre, for example, while keeping the rest exactly the same. Yeah, so you're still with each other, but there's one change. Um, or you do totally different things, but you slowly approach each other on only one or two of two or two dimensions of uh, the music. Um, so uh, all kinds of variety can arise from this, of course, but. First, you have to train the one extreme and the other extreme because then you're available for all the other possibilities in between. That's the philosophy. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, I, yeah, we, we have the, 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 the cutting someone in half, which is an interesting, uh, different thing to talk about. It's actually talking about Aikido training. And, um, uh, why I found it so interesting to include my Aikido experience uh, into genetic choir training is because, uh, especially this cutting someone else in half. Uh, so you have a, you know, in Aikido, you train attacks as well as uh, defense things. And you train, for example, to cut with a sword someone right through the middle. And... Um, it's such an interesting, interesting thing to train because uh, all the things we're talking about until now are uh, about copying, about moving with, about aligning. But we also need this other energy. We also need this energy of just, you know, there's something beautiful happening and I just allow myself to cut right through it with a new proposition. Um, yeah, you also really need to train that. And you, of course, you have some people who find that more difficult than others. And maybe there are some people who don't need to train this at all because they do it all the time. So they need to train more of the absorbing and aligning. But surely also this cutting someone in half is really, really useful to train. And, um, there's more to it. So if I go just for a little bit into it, one thing is about this decisiveness and clarity. So cutting someone in half, you know, it just, it's clear, you know, you're dead. I'm cutting you through. Um, but we also train in Aikido the absorbing and the moving with. So that's the beautiful beauty of Aikido. It's uh, taking the energy of the, of the attacker and aligning yourself with the attacker and uh, trying to control the situation without hurting your attacker. So there are two principles like Irimi and Tenkan in Aikido. Irimi is moving in, cutting through. Tenkan is moving with, you know, making space for the other's movement to be absorbed. Um, and the other thing about Aikido practice, why it is so interesting for improvisation singers, I think, is the idea of center and periphery. 
Um, because what you train in Aikido is to be centered and rooted while also being available to blend with the movement of the other. So we have yeah some very concrete exercises, movement exercises that we do that are about uh, not losing your own center, not lo losing your own position and base while absorbing the other person's movement. And uh, in music... In music, this would be, of course, uh, in music, this would be like you have your own, huh, your own musical idea, which is you're presenting. Um, next to you are other things happening. And I allow these things to invade my idea. I allow to absorb it without losing my center, without losing my, yeah, I had, I had a certain interest in my idea. And now that it changes through the influence of the other singers, I might get lost. You know, I might sort of yeah, lose my idea because it's not clear anymore. So how to deal with this, like how to how to stay centered while you absorb information from the singers around you is uh, something we also train and we use the physical training uh, to strengthen this idea in the singing. Any questions about this? Um isn't it also nice to completely lose yourself yes absolutely i mean a lot of it's about like you know learn somehow there's also this idea that there isn't a self right that we're all like part of this bigger collective and um so somehow it's it's like it's that's that's an interesting experience right to be to to enter into that reality well, if um, I if I sing together in this way, and it works, I'm losing myself because I'm I'm not myself anymore. I'm part of an organism that is moved, that is catering for the music, mm. that is in the music. And I yeah, totally I guess I'm just questioning this like distinction you make between the center and the or questioning. I don't know, but just like I'm reflecting upon what you just said about this kind of center and periphery. And, yeah, in terms of uh, and how the center needs to kind of like remain. You had this earlier also, this idea that the the seed the that the needs to be kind of stable and clear. And I think there's also something about this top down emergence, right? Where you just you don't know, you don't know what your idea is and you and you're lost in the hole and you're waiting to be formed. To me, it's yeah. just like one of the possible strategies, like when you want to be that egoistic bird <laughs> and want to have your idea, this is where this Aikido kind of center and periphery comes in. Because if you if you follow, you follow. So you don't really like want you don't want to establish your idea, introduce your idea, right? Well, I think again, it's a bit difficult to bring across if you don't do it this practically. But actually, even in following. I think you shouldn't lose your center, and mm. and and that's uh, you should or you shouldn't. No, you shouldn't lose your center. You know, you should be. I should be available, totally. But I should also have a sense of myself in order to still be able to make choices. You know, if you say like I'm losing yourself is beautiful. Uh, just because you know it's beautiful to just you know drink a lot and lose myself and and have a great night. On an evening, you know, I totally agree, but I'm actually not so interested in people doing that on stage. You know, I'm not so interested in people losing themselves unless it's a it's performance art and it has a certain reason. You know, why you want to give me this experience? Mm -hmm. Then, okay, of course. But, but that's so why I sorry. Yeah, that's why I think that this fourth category is quite important, actually, of the mind of of like the identity of like you know you have like texture. Uh, meaning, uh, what was it? Time, but I think identity is also a very important one. Yeah, like you have to know like what is you and what is other, and yes. like what is this whole, this whole swarm, this whole like uh, uh, super organism, this collective mind that you're that you're trying to become or trying to be a part of. That that's a that's a that's another sense of uh, of of uh, of identity. And it, it's 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 not meaning because it's the thing that has the meaning, and it's the thing that yeah. makes the meaning. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. I I would say that the you know it, for me the identity is also the music. So so my music 
that I'm now proposing, this is my identity. Right? Because I'm not, not, not interested to engage with you as Thomas. I'm engaging you. I'm interested to be the transmitter of this music. And this music is my identity and it meets other identities. And together we create this bigger identity, which is yeah. Swarm. Yeah. But there's, there's a nice analogy, I think, with um, if I... Uh... Just to bring in Francis, is there a nice, a nice, a nice relationship? I think with this like relational agency work that you're doing. No, like this idea that there's you need to kind of retain a kind of like certain amount of identity as an agent through time, but you also need to be somehow generous enough to give away your resources, right? To kind of blend with other identities, almost to the point where you risk losing your identity. Yeah. So that you can create. Uh, the, so the, the complexity, the kind of the complex adaption can keep going on. And yet still, again, you s come back to this idea of being this agent, right? Like this agent maintaining its identity through time. But there's somehow there is this like generosity in giving away your resources, right? Like entering into reactions with others, no? Either yeah. as a human being or as a musical idea. Yeah, maybe maybe the center, you know, it's it's not really like it doesn't really make sense to think about it in terms of identity. But this is where this this in interest you had you said in intensive <laughs> interest is because interest intensive interest in making music is what kind of music you just want to now sound yes, and uh, like what do you like what do you pick up and what do you make. And that would be the center. What what captivates your attention such that you want to return to it somehow or like hear it basically, uh, something like that. Right? So yeah. it's like your the center of your agency at the moment, which is the same as the center of your interest at the moment. I suppose. Yeah. If you lose your center of your interest or your center of why, I don't. You know, you don't have to rationally know why, but. I'm here in this position with my music because I find it interesting. I mean, this is what I mean with, with center. And, and then I can be absorbed. I can be uh, thrown off that or the danger of being thrown off that because of all the information coming to me and the information that I'm absorbing. In that absorbing, my identity could totally change. Yeah? So my musical identity of what I'm proposing could totally change. I don't have to hold on to my identity. Because it's not me, it's the music. The music is the identity. So the original identity could totally change and become a different identity. But my connection to it, my intense interest in that identity any in any shape, that has to sort of remain. And that's why Aikido training is good in a way because it it's about this just, okay, be centered even if somebody is cutting you half through. I mean, be mm -hmm. connected. You know, you don't have to sort of uh, yeah, um, you don't have to close yourself off from the situation, even though there's something, you know, strong coming to you. Like all, like like ten singers singing at the same time be, can be quite, you know, heavy on your system. And 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 training, like you know, being cut through half, for example, and absorbing that without losing your center helps also in the singing to just stay there and absorb the situation and move through it and make connections and move on. So this is the yeah. energy we're making. I have a few remarks about Aikido. And well, of course, it's a, it's an analogy you're making. But in Aikido, there is this strong hierarchy of the roles of Uke and Tori, the one who gives the attack and mm -hmm. the one who receives it, uh, which you, well, Yes, which is uh, one big difference with the kind of self-organization because in self-organization, you don't want to set the hierarchy in advance. Yes, we don't use that. I mean, we, yeah. we, we only use the training. Uh, we don't use the hierarchical structure of Aikido. Right, right. And the other big difference I see is that uh, Aikido is mostly like 80, 90% of the case, a one-to-one -one, uh, art. Whereas the choir is, I don't know how, yeah, however big your choir is. Uh, yeah. So, but but it could be good to brainstorm how actually the improvisation techniques that you develop could lead to other kind of martial arts or 
maybe <laughs> dance art. Like how would you do improvisation with five people dancing or fighting together? And I don't know. It's an ah, idea. interesting thought. Interesting thought. Yeah. No, because we only train a certain attitude, a certain physical attitude. And that is, we train that one-on-one -on -one, indeed, or on your own, like moving on your own. Uh, it doesn't matter how, you know, you can apply this to two singers or three singers or five singers singing at the same time. Uh, it's it's a principle. We just train a certain mindset. Oh, yeah. Mindset, yeah. A certain mindset and a certain sensitivity. Okay, I see that it's almost time. Uh, I just had, yeah, I wanted to show you more of this. What do I have else? Uh, yeah, this is just a summary, you could say. Uh, so you can be free as a bird. Uh, you can really make your own choices as long as you are intensely interested. Uh, that's the identity of the music that we just talked about. You can also swarm. You have the ability to swarm and make connections with other singers and absorb aspects of their music and move with them uh, and absorbing these aspects part of this evolutionary idea of composition you could say uh, taking dna from other sound sources in the moment and you can cut and take space with a new thing uh, and this is this last aspect of for example aikido training uh, that you really yeah i mean being free as a bird is still different from cutting through uh the existing music you know if you just do your own thing unconnected um that's much easier than consciously saying like okay this has to have space you know i'm cutting through the beautiful melodies that are going on now with a straight beat and this is my composition you know it's 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 a much it's much stronger than just doing your own thing on the side so this is also why it's so uh, and and if you don't uh, I, for for i think the first two or three years with genetic choir we didn't train this so strongly and it actually means that the compositions like the emerging compositions um, stay a bit in the same area i mean they they, they always have the sort of same shape and as soon as we also started training cutting through And taking space, um, it really changed the whole dynamic. So, yeah, all sorts of much more sudden and much more exciting dynamics could happen because of that. Um, oh, yeah, and the cutting and absorbing, it's not only two different possibilities of action or interaction. Uh, so it's not only that I can choose now I'm cutting or now I'm absorbing things. It's actually part of... Aikido training also that in the cutting, I'm, I'm also absorbing already the energy of the other. Um, and when absorbing and moving with the other person, I'm also taking space at the same time as absorbing. And uh, it sounds me maybe very abstract, but, you know, in the actual training, it's an essential thing that it's not only two different things. It's also something that can happen at the same time taking space and giving space at the very same moment. Uh, yeah, one example would be holding your own musical space, keeping your own clarity and de definition while letting other musical DNA invade your music and absorbing aspects of the music around you. Um, or, for example, singing a very clear song with conviction and definition, but at the same time allowing the audience in, uh, absorbing the energy of the audience letting it change you from the inside while singing um, that the audience is looking at you and this affects the song. I mean, this is what, you know, the best performers always do. They, they sing in the moment and let the situation uh, inform their way of singing the song. Yeah. So I think this was it. Uh, I don't. We have time for, to for. I, I had these other two videos to 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 show you a bit longer, but I think it's already time, isn't it, Marta? Yeah, it's it's already time. It was very very interesting. Do, do you do we still uh, have some some comments to uh, Orion? Um, what did I want to say? Um, 
thanks it's really it's it's a nice um it's great talk and great work i think it's really it's it's even better to experience it than to uh than to than to talk about it and watch slides about it but it's great i um some of the questions you're ask, asking, especially about like how to identify um, material or how, how things are clear or not clear, what counts as information or not, and so on, these kinds of things. Um, you, probably, I, you, you probably looked at it already, some, some of the material, but it would be really interesting to look not so much at genetics, but, but at mimetics, the study of mimetics, like yeah. what because in memetics, it's quite a big problem, right? Like what, what is actually a meme? Mm -hmm. Like what actually defines something which is copied and something which is not copied, right? Like, so you have, in genetics, it's kind of, I guess, somewhat clear, like what's a gene and what's not a gene. But, but in memetics, it's not clear at all. Like why does a certain idea become contagious in, and start being replicated in a group of people or in a society, whereas it could be, you could, cut the you could cut the cake another way right and it could be some other aspect which makes it contagious so mm -hmm. i think there's probably quite some interesting literature there to sort of clarify some of these thoughts and some of these terms um in mm. memetics. okay yeah I, I i only know about memetics and uh but i don't know the discussions inside uh, that field indeed it's interesting to look at it thank you Well, it's like more general thing, but like you were, I was thinking where one thing you were saying was like the emergent behavior of the system needs to be allowed to be the decision maker where like you don't allow human decisions. So I was thinking whether we can use it like as a sort of general way of human organization, whether we want that to like let things emerge instead of like always trying to make conscious decisions or something and like. <laughs> I was wondering whether we can use it as like an analogy for like this kind of way of working for like other kind of social organizations where um, you also said like the IQ2 thing. Uh, yeah, it, it would be great. Eh? I mean, we also have this utopian idea to, 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 to take this into how people organize themselves. Uh, and it would be great if you could say like, okay, the local decisions, like you only need to make local decisions and then the global decisions of where the organization as a whole is going towards or what decisions are being made are emerging. Um, but I think it's really, it, it, it really is much more complicated. And the main fact why that is, is because in an organization where you're working together, you're not all the time exactly at the same time at the same spot. And with improvisation singing, you are, you know, at that moment, you're creating a performance and all the interaction is happening there and everybody is there um and if you take this into you know more complex human relationships and social organizations that oh. is in my experience the main problem that we don't have this being together at the same time at the same place it seems to me uh yeah sorry yeah no just yeah. another idea uh inspired by improvisation theater there are some exercises where you have some um different spaces where you can be somewhere someone else uh so i mean it's setting a, a constraint but it could be interesting to have this for a choir where um, at this place they do kind of beatboxing there they do melody and and so people could could uh, navigate freely from one place to another and and see what a simple structure like this could uh, could afford mm. Nice, thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like a good, nice, interesting workflow. Yeah. Yeah, if I can also ask, uh, add one point of view. Hello. Um, yeah. It just made me, the whole speech made me think about this uh, Finnish theater maker and philosopher, Esakir Kopelto, if you know him, and his uh, project Other Spaces, I think it's called. And they always create. Um, these kind of exercises like it's not completely an improvisation even though it then kind of turns into improvisation because at the beginning they have some kind of set up um concrete um 
recipe or a concrete, um, you know, like first steps or for different stones on which to step uh, in this creation. And they are always trying to embody a certain species or a different, um, yeah, different someone. It can be a herd of, um, um, how is it called? The reindeers? Um, or it can be stars. It can be even colors or, um, for example, we did one exercise with him about being on snails. And it was so interesting that you would only do like four different movements. And in the stretch of time, you would really completely transform into that being with even the thinking, you know, and it just made me this kind of similar feeling of what you were explaining. So I maybe just wanted to enrich you with this point of view. And Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sounds great. And thank you for the talk. It was really amusing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. We uh, we are yeah, we're really behind the the, the time, yeah. so it's probably time to time to finish. But I, it seems that the conversation could go on, yes, in a in a self organizing uh, way. But what I'm will going to do now is cut through. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and we and we go we we here go to a bar and uh, yeah and we we close the. The Zoom session. So, so, so wonderful. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, yeah, my really pleasure. Thank you for the attention, all of you. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>